I've got my hands on a Mac Studio, and this one's equipped with the M1 Ultra chip. I'm gonna be testing it with Photoshop, Lightroom, Capture One, Final Cut Pro, Premiere Pro, and Resolve, because I wanna know how it performs in real life production environments. And we're gonna see what it takes to slow it down. This particular Mac Studio is basically top of the line, has 128 gigs of RAM and the 64 core GPU. So this could be the fastest Mac I've ever worked with, probably even faster than the giant Mac Pro I reviewed back in 2019. But there's a big difference. That machine cost about $12,000 and you can get into an M1 Ultra starting at $4,000. So let's see what it can do. So I'm gonna start with Lightroom Classic. It's notoriously poorly optimized, even though it does run well on M1 chips. In my previous test, it doesn't really know how to take advantage of all the cores and stuff. So hopefully it's in better shape now, but in this case, it's usually the software that's the bottleneck rather than the hardware. To start, we'll download some photos into the built-in SD card reader. So glad I can say that again. I've got 100 raw photos here that I just shot around the studio. They're all taken on the Canon R5, so that's 45 megapixel files. Each one's 49 megabytes. And that took 48 seconds for five gigs of photos, which was about the same on the M1 Max MacBook Pro that I'll also be running some of these tests on just as a control. So let's just see what it's like flipping through photos. I mean, these have previews, so they should be fine. Yeah, zooming in is more or less instant. Now let's apply one of my presets to it and then sync that with everything. Make sure that we have all of our lens correction on. That's something that can slow it down, but this is pretty smooth. It still has that hesitation that Lightroom's always had. I blame Lightroom for that. So if you were hoping that an M1 Ultra would fix it, it's not fixed yet. These are kind of cool. Does this have Instagram potential? Maybe. And exporting JPEGs, the Ultra comes in almost 50% faster than the Max. Wow. Now, I expected this to run smoothly because most photo editing stuff is well handled by the M1 Max. So I asked you guys on Instagram, like what could actually stress this? And one of the suggestions was just a bunch of clone stamps. So I'm not sure where this photo needs it, but let's just do a whole bunch in a row. One, two, three, 17, 18, 19. Okay, now let's draw a line. Oh yeah, it's starting to chug a little. Now something that always slows it down is stitching a panorama. I've got 15 images here. And stitching those together on the Ultra took 38 seconds, giving us a 128 megapixel file. And on the M1 Max, it took 10 seconds longer. Exporting those 101 photos from Lightroom, I also did it on my Intel Max. This is from 2018, just to see how far we've come. And that took five minutes, 10 seconds. This was a fast computer once. At the M1 Max, it took one minute, 29 seconds. So that, that is a huge jump, that's amazing. And then going to the Ultra took 53 seconds. Also very impressive, that is a good improvement. Looking at the design of the Mac Studio, it's incredibly simple, but I love that they weren't shy about adding a ton of ports. So you've got all of the in and out you're ever gonna need. And in studios, this will all get used. Every single thing on the back of this will be full someday. And if you're trying to decide between the M1 Max and the M1 Ultra, these two ports become Thunderbolt on the Ultra and there isn't enough data throughput on the Max to have everything be Thunderbolt. So these become USB-C. If I'm gonna nitpick, this is the most powerful Mac available right now. It costs quite a bit of money. And if a client comes into the studio, I want it to look like we have the best Mac. And this doesn't really have that design language. It looks very utilitarian. It looks like the Mac mini. So I can't wait to see what the Mac Pro looks like. And I know that sounds very superficial and shallow, but cameras, think about this, like the Red and the Alexa look like big professional powerhouses. But the Mac Studio is a perfect example of Apple returning to form over function in their new design language. And I love it. And now that we have a giant image, let's move to our next tests in Photoshop. By the way, if you wanna see how the computer is working down here are the CPUs and over here, this is the GPU. So you can see when it's being put to work. So the image on its own here isn't gonna do much. I'm gonna run my action that I run on everything. If you wanna see that tutorial, the link is in the description. You can download those actions. And this is just like a bunch of layers that I use on a really regular basis. So it's got like dodge and burn in there and some layers that you can mask in to cool or warm up the scene. But that's definitely not enough. Everything's still running smoothly. So I'm gonna duplicate that giant layer. I'm going to, let's turn it into a smart object, which means that the filters I'm about to put on it aren't fully baked in. So let's add a lens simulated blur to it, say 50 pixels, it's a lot, and uh, maybe 20% grain and time it. They both did it in 11 seconds. So I don't know, something's gotta slow this down. I'll make another new layer and I'll use a heal brush and make it really big and just heal stuff. Oh yeah, that's slow. 
<laughs> okay, there we go, slowed it down. Let's try adding a text layer. Yeah, that still works great, absolutely no problems. Okay, I'm gonna call it. For most people running Photoshop in the M1 Ultra, you really can't slow it down. I mean, that was a almost six gigabyte PSD. Actually, PSB, which is only for those extra large files. Next up, we'll test the software used in virtually every professional photo studio. But a, a little bit of feedback. If this is being used in a production environment, like say on a camera cart, which Apple was showing in their commercials and their keynotes, this is a really common way to do things on set. And having a small powerhouse like this it's gonna be great for adding to camera cards. But one thing that could have made it so much better, because the entry-level model of the Mac Studio, which is $2,000 and runs the M1 Max, that is the same processor as in the MacBook Pro. I'd love to see an option or, or something with a battery in here. I know, I know that sounds crazy. Why would you put a battery? It's not a laptop, it's a desktop. And the M1 Ultra might be too power hungry to even run off of a battery for more than five minutes, I don't know. But in professional situations, there's gonna be a giant battery on that camera cart that is powering this thing all day long, or it might be hot swappable V-mounts. If there's just a little bit of backup in here so that you know if that power cable gets jiggled in just the wrong way, it can keep running, that would really help out a lot of pros. So just food for thought, Apple. Okay, now let's dive into Capture One. And just for fun, I'm gonna leave Photoshop running here because that's something that happens in the real world all the time. I've got an industry standard Tether Tools USB-C cable running into the R5, and then, I'm so happy I can say this, into the front of the Mac Studio. A lot of the reason the Capture One is standard is because it's the best for tethering. Often, I don't shoot tethered when I'm doing professional work because it slows me down. On my older 2018 Intel laptop, we would wait so long between photos that it just wasn't worth it. But now, based on tests I've seen on Instagram, I check out Brooks Digi if you're interested in this. I don't think I'll even be able to run out the buffer using the R5 unless I'm shooting like crazy fast. So let's just do some basic tests. When I'm just shooting like a normal human at regular speed here, it just actually basically keeps up. It has the live preview ready right away, which is the most important thing is that you're able to see your image in full resolution as soon as you step over to your computer and you can zoom all the way in and check focus and zoom back out. But I've got this big timer here, so I'm gonna shoot for 10 seconds straight and see how long it takes to get me up to date with a live preview. And I'm gonna go at high speed continuous mode and I'm looking at two seconds. So it's about like eight seconds behind. That took 41 seconds to catch up. It looks like about the same on the M1 Max, so I'm not seeing a big difference here. I'd say that's good news. Whether you get the M1 Ultra or the M1 Max, you're gonna be in great shape for tethering, which is so much faster than it used to be in the Intel days. Now for Capture One to export those same photos, the 2018 Intel Mac took four minutes, 14 seconds. The M1 Max took one minute, 41 seconds, and the Ultra took one minute, 33 seconds. I have heard there is an update coming from Capture One to further optimize the M1, so we should test this again in the future because it should be speeding up more. I've created a bit of a mega project here in Final Cut Pro, so this is my primary editing space, and this will have something in it, I think, that can slow down the M1 Ultra. So starting with this footage, this is 5.7K, and it's coming from the GH6 and it has some basic grades on it. So just let's take a look at what, uh, all of them are the same, by the way. So all of them have um, my transform LUT on them. This is just using a C-Log2 on and my film LUT that gives it kind of that look. So that's a you know pretty basic grade for, for Final Cut and it can play back perfectly smoothly. And let's just clarify that up here, it is on better quality. And also let's make sure that we have deleted any proxies or any optimized media. 5.6K compressed, no problem at all. And I gotta point out, the most important thing in the video editing is actually your ability to navigate through the file. That's a much bigger deal than just export times. Export times are good for benchmarks because they're easy to compare, you just have one number. But what actually matters is like, can you work with the files? And so that's what we're here to find out. So in between, I've got a little transition here. Let's see if it plays. All right, that did slow down a bit. So it's a little like film burn and it can't quite play through it smoothly. These next ones, this is a 4K file, 60 frames per second from the Canon R5. It's totally fine. And I've got effects all throughout here that are coming from Motion VFX. So here's a little spotlight, turns on, no problem, doesn't slow down. And then this is an 8K file from the R5, also compressed, playing back totally smoothly. But I've got another effect, let's turn it on. Oh, some lens flare, still good. Now moving to another transition from Motion VFX, and it cannot play it back smoothly. <laughs> 
And just for reference, let's render that section. It took three or four seconds there, and when we play back, that's what it's supposed to look like. And next up, we got some 6K red raw footage. This is provided by Cam Mackey. He was just on the podcast the other day. This is beautiful and playing extremely smoothly. Again, this just has like some basic grading. It's just got my LUTs on it, nothing special going on. So let's try adding the Motion VFX vintage look. This adds film grain, and you can see there's some like smudges on the lens and some prism effects. And I think we're basically still playing back in real time. I'm seeing a little bit of stuttering. This isn't perfectly smooth. Let's go back to without. Yeah, yeah, there's some, there's some minor stutters. Once I've got all those effects on there, this is a pretty heavy look. So I, I'm not surprised to see it slow things down, but also I do have my vector scope and waveform over here. So these can slow things down when they're visible as well. All right, and we got another transition. Nope, not quite. <laughs> this is moving to the big one. So this is 8K raw. I saw a little bit of dropped frames here with the uh, title over top. So let's see what happens if I hide the title. And yeah, okay, now I'm getting smooth playback. A couple dropped frames here and there, but mostly smooth. And just to confirm what's going on here, there, there's a little bit more. So I've got a bit more of an in-depth grade here. I have uh, color wheels and film convert nitrate. That's definitely heavier going on there, which is also adding some film grain. So all of that, that is a much bigger lift. I'm gonna just turn that off for a second. So with no effects, it is, oh, it's still dropping some frames. So I'm turning off all the effects. I'm actually getting some weird results here. So I'll just show it to you because uh, I can't quite troubleshoot it. So you can see I'm dropping some frames. This is on a 4K timeline, but I've also created an 8K timeline of the same project. So here it is with all the effects on, all the color grading. And in 8K, those same clips are playing back completely smooth. So I don't know what's going on here. Canon raw footage is like really heavy. It's less smooth to play back than red raw footage typically. To export this very chunky one minute timeline as a 4K MP4, it took the Intel three minutes and 46 seconds, it took the M1 Max one minute and two seconds, and it took the M1 Ultra 51 seconds. So we're seeing a bit of a gain with the Ultra, but again, it's that jump from Intel that just blows me away. I'm a Final Cut Pro editor. It's made by Apple, so it should be optimized. Now we're gonna try out Premiere. One quick word to anybody from the Final Cut team, if you happen to be watching, the color pipeline needs some work in Final Cut Pro. It's super weird and much easier to work with in both Premiere and Resolve, so I don't know. So I've got all the same clips set up in Premiere here. I don't use it as often, so I'm gonna move through this quickly. Uh, the timeline is currently set to 8K, and you can see I can scrub through and I can play things pretty well, like the 5.7K is playing fine. The red 6K also playing fine. 8K raw, whoa, look at the CPU, it goes crazy. Can't play that back in 8K. Now playing back on 4K timeline, that is totally smooth. 60 frames per second, also smooth. 8K compressed is dropping frames. Now it's playing smooth, I can't decide. It's doing a bit of both. Red 6K footage is playing smoothly. Yeah, not dropping any frames there. In 8K RAW, I just love watching those CPUs explode. 8K RAW is not playing smoothly on a 4K timeline. Let's just look at it at half resolution for a second here. All right, half resolution plays back fine. Now DaVinci Resolve 17, my favorite place to work with color. Let's go through the basics quick. The GH6 footage, still smooth. 8K compressed. Totally smooth. And the Komodo Red Raw 6K, also smooth. Cam was on the podcast the other day, so I asked him, what can I do to really push it? Like, you know, assuming you and I do basically the same work, like where do you ever run into the limits of the M1 Max? Da Vinci, do a 4K timeline with 8K footage, noise reduction, turn it up, do a transform to log, to a, a, a log, and then a 709 LUT, and between that, and see right. if it plays it back. If it plays it back, yeah. I'm running out the door to get it. So I think to slow this down, we're gonna have to apply a denoising layer. You can see the settings over here. Uh, maybe turn it up a little stronger just for fun. And here's one thing I love about Resolve. It shows me the frame rate that I'm playing back at, which is currently 18, 19. So a little low, this is 24 frames per second footage. So we're dropping some frames here. Definitely can't quite play back denoised footage. And let's go all out, add one more note at the end where we've got some serious grain and halation added to it. 
All right, there we go. Now we're slowing it down, down to 14 frames, 12 frames per second. All right, no big surprise there. It starts to chug a little bit with all of that going on, but that's denoise and grain and halation. These are very heavy processes. The Mac Studio is a pretty easy product to understand. It's got a lot of ports and a small box that fits on your desk with an amazing processor inside. And if you're trying to decide between the M1 Max and the M1 Ultra, I'd say the M1 Max is what most people want. The Ultra is gonna bring some moderate gains and if you have the budget for it, you can squeeze every last drop of performance out of the M1 chips. But I think that the M1 Max has already given us so many gains that even people doing professional work are gonna be served just fine by it. And as much as I love this computer, I already miss the 27 inch iMac because I've been using them for so many years and every creative studio I've worked in had a ton of them. So if you're trying to figure out which monitor to get, do you need the Apple Studio display? I did a full review on that. So that should be the next video you watch. I'll see you guys there.